my name is Fanny Charles and I'm the editor of the Blackmore Vale magazine and I was asked to chair this. I don't know quite how to follow that. <laughs> um, other than to say as a Cornish farmer that the idea that a small field is 50 acres <laughs> is a, <laughs> somewhat of a surprise. That's a, that's a third of my farm. Um, as I've just said, I'm a Cornish farmer. I um, have also been involved for quite a long time on the issues surrounding GM. And one of the things that I've been able to do is to travel quite a bit um, and meet farmers from around the world. So I've met farmers from the US, I've met farmers from uh, India on their farms um, and, and spoken to them about GM. And what, I, what Percy didn't say is that his story is repeated many, many times, except that those farmers didn't do what he's done and to take on Monsanto. I met farmers that, that, as Percy was talking about uh, a few minutes ago, who wouldn't talk to me, even though I was an English farmer and had come you know, over to visit them on their farms about GM and about the fact that Monsanto um, and other companies had done what he was referring to in the letters, taken them or threatened to take them to court. Um, they showed me all the letters. Again, they're not supposed to. I, at one point, I hoped that maybe I could get some copies of these letters. But Monsanto are quite clever, and, and the other companies, that each letter is individually written. So if you took them and tried to reproduce them, they would probably be able to trace back where they came from. And all of them have a, a gagging order on them. And I met many, many farmers right across seven or eight states in the US who had signed these and were, the other key thing that they do is to insist that you then grow GMOs, um, which is why they can then claim, of course, that you know, 10 million farmers or whatever it is they claim around the world grow GM. Well, of course they do. If you've got your arm up your back, you're going to grow them. Um, what about the situation facing UK farmers? I think there's not a lot of difference between what Percy's experience, the experience I saw of other farmers in the US and us. The law, a lot of the laws of the US and of, of Canada in particular are similar to our legal system. Um, and those patents will apply here. Um, those technological agreements will apply here. They'll have to, otherwise there's not much point in them introducing GMO crops to Europe because it's not just, of course, the UK, it's also a Europe-wide thing. Um, so for me as a farmer and a UK farmer, what really frightens me is that, that I will lose the choice, my right as a farmer, to grow what I want to grow and to produce what consumers tell me that they want. Um, and I don't see how if we introduced GM crops to the UK that we're going to be able to not, to, we're going to be able to grow non-GM crops because as Percy said it took very few years to get the whole of Canada GM only. Um, we're tiny compared with the size of Canada it wouldn't take very long at all for the spread across the UK. Probably surprising to you, I would also say that the farmers that want to grow GM probably should have the right to grow GM if they want to do that. You can't have the right one way and not the other. But at the same time, those farmers that wish to grow it have got to take responsibility for it if it affects the farmers that don't want to grow it. Um, and that um, most farmers that I've spoken to that are pro-GM, shall we say, when I say, okay, fine, if you want to grow it, as long as when I get it onto my fields or the organic farmer gets it, um, he has some right to come back to you and say, excuse me, you've just ruined my business because I can't sell what I've grown. And the immediate answer is, well, I can't be responsible for what the wind does. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to be because you know, otherwise farmers like myself that don't want to grow it or organic farmers that don't want to grow it 
are not going to have their rights. Um, there was two things I wanted to mention further, I think, because I'm sure you've all got lots of questions to ask Percy. One was, um, I'm pretty sure that the technological agreement that Percy had just now also states that Monsanto is not responsible beyond the germination of the seed. So going back to what was said right at the start, where does it end? As far as I'm aware on that agreement, and the same in the US, basically, like a normal seed supplier, if it germinates, okay, it's yours. If it doesn't germinate, you can go back to them and say, this seed you've provided me with doesn't work. But I think that, again, brings up the question, where does their responsibility end and start? And we need to define that. And I think there is a great deal to be done on the laws regarding patents and this, which is possibly even more important than whether GMOs are safe to eat or use or whatever, because it, it's not just about uh, crops. It's also about genes that they've taken patents out on, on human beings. When I was in India, there was Indian farmers who had... I mean, if you can imagine people who are very poorly educated, they have the concept of somebody owning a gene inside something, if they even understand what the gene part is, is uncomprehensible. And they often said to me that this plant here is a medicinal plant. We use it for headaches or whatever it was that they used that plant for. But we know, we've been told, we can't use it now because Monsanto or Sagenta or whoever it is has patented the genes of that plant and we're not allowed to use it. So it, there are issues um, surrounding things. And I often, when people say, well, what do you mean? If you look at it like this microphone, somebody has designed this, taken out a patent on it, and you can't produce a microphone that looks like that because you'll infringe their patent. That's fine. I can understand that. But when it becomes uh, nature and it's transferable and you have no control over it, then I do not see that the current patent laws can apply to that. And I think we need to change it. The other thing from a British farmer's point of view, um, knowing that I was coming here today to um, speak very briefly on this, I rang around a number of insurance companies and asked them what their position was on liability. And basically, they were not willing to discuss it, is probably the best way to put it. Um, they, their excuse, their get-out clause was, well, we don't have any GMO crops in the UK, therefore it's not an issue at the moment. Only one company, when I pushed them, said that they probably would not insure anybody for any liability. So for any farmers that, that unless that changes, unless... For any farmers that, if we adopt it and grow it, any farmers that grow it will, could more than likely find themselves out on their own. Um, and that has happened in Spain. There are a number of organic farmers that had um, GM maize, which is grown in Spain, grown alongside them, and they got um, the GM trait into their organic, lost their organic status, and have had no way of coming back because they're their neighbours, all they'll do is put them out of business if they sue them. They've not got enough money to sue Monsanto or Sagenta or whoever the supplier of the, the maize was. Um, they have nothing except that they have lost their status as organic farmers. So I think we need to, to question seriously, not just on whether it's safe to use, safe to think, or whether it works for farmers in terms of more or less pesticides or whatever, but on the question of this patents and the rights surrounding that, and not just about the other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.